Ave Maria. When they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it to me. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found the colt tied to the door out in the open street, and they untied it. And those who stood there said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? And they told him that Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought it, the colt to Jesus and threw their garments on it, and he sat upon it. And many spread their garments on the road, and others spread leafy branches, which they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed after cried out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessing and blessed is the kingdom of our father David that is coming. Hosanna in the highest. Our Lord entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. It was the month of Nisan, the month, the first month of the year when the Jews celebrated Passover. According to the Lord of Moses, Four days before Passover, the lamb had to be chosen. Having been chosen, it was brought to the priest for blessing, for sanctification. And then on the, um, the vigil before the Passover, the lamb would be slaughtered and the blood would be sprinkled on the lintels as the the Jews had done in Egypt. This is a reminder of the Passover of the Lord. And so this was a great sacrifice. John the Baptist had said to his disciples, I say, watch, behold the Lamb of God. Our Lord was passing by. And John stared intensely at him. This was the Lamb that the Israelites had been waiting for, and more than the Israelites, the whole world. They were waiting for the Lamb the sacrifice that would take away our sins. And here, after John had first proclaimed our Lord to be the Lamb of God, the Lamb enters into Jerusalem four days before Passover. And we heard about his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. He had, during the previous three years, refused to accept the adulation the praise of the crowd. He had worked in many miracles. We think, for instance, of the multiplication of the loaves. And when the people saw this sign, they wanted to make him king. But we're told our Lord escaped into the hills. He went to hide. Because the kingship they were offering him, the kingship they expected of him, was not what he had come for. He was certainly a king. He was born a king. No one could make him a king. But it was not a kingdom, as he would tell Pilate, it's not a kingdom of this kind, of this world. It was a different kind of kingdom. It was an eternal kingdom. And so he refused to be um, acknowledged as a king after the multiplication of the loaves. He refused also to allow his disciples to declare who he was. So when he raised the, the dead, the little girl, he said, do not tell anybody about it. When he came down the mountain after his transfiguration, he said, do not tell anyone, because the people would assume that he was a king of this world, of this kind. He had worked other miracles. He had restored the sight of the man born blind, something never done before. But the miracle that was the most disturbing for the authorities was the resurrection of Lazarus. There was no denying that this was indeed a miracle, for Lazarus had been four days dead. 
And there was, of course, a celebration for the resurrection of Lazarus. And the people came to, to um, the house of Mary and Martha. They came out of curiosity. They wanted to see a man who was dead and was now alive. But there were friends also of Lazarus who came. And the news would spread. And the people hearing this would, of course, want to see Jesus. And we're told by St. John, they were leaving the Pharisees and they were believing in Jesus. And so we're told uh, by St. Mark on this Sunday, our Lord had spent the week with his friends in Bethany. He had visited the temple um, and spoken. But now he is leaving um, Bethany, the house of obedience. And he is coming to Jerusalem. He's going to be obedient to his father, even unto death. Our Lord now demonstrates his humanity as well as his divinity. We're told that as they approached the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go off to the village facing you, and as soon as you enter it, you will find a tethered colt that no one has yet ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone says to you, What are you doing? Say the master needs it and will send it back directly. This is the only place in scripture where our Lord says the master needs it, that he needs it something from us. And it's really quite incredible that God should want anything from us who has given us all things. But the only place our Lord says the master needs it is here. And what does he need from us that we refuse to give but our devotion and our love and our loyalty? And it's not because he needs it, but he needs it for our sake because we are the beneficiaries of his need. And so he demonstrates his, divinity, his humanity by saying he has a need, for, for his heart is human. But he also demonstrates his divinity when he tells them, the, the, the apostles, the, what to do and what will in fact happen. Go into the village. As soon as you enter, you will see a tethered colt which no one has written. How do you know that? Because he's God. He says, go to it, untie it, and bring it here. Fair enough. But then he says, if anyone says, what are you doing? Why are you untying it? Then say the master has need of it. And will send it back. And it's exactly as the Lord had said. What does the cult represent? In fact, in the, let, in the Gospel according to Matthew and Luke, we're told there was also the mother of the cult. So the, the mother is there, her fold is there, but the Lord specifically asks for the fold. And so the, the mother represents the Jewish people. Whereas the colt, unridden, the Gentiles. And as we know with any animal that has not yet been broken in, if we attempt to ride it, it's going to buck. And certainly if we attempt to ride it in a crowd where it's not used to, it's certainly going to um, be disturbed and it's going to buck and it's going to throw the rider. But none of this happens. Our Lord's in total control. So he shows that he's going to, he's going to ride on the Gentiles. The Gentiles are the ones who are going to ex accept him. And how do we know this? We know this from the context for what do we read? They went off and found the colt tethered near a door in the open street. And it's not just an open street, we're actually told that it was the crossroads, two roads meeting, where the colt was tethered. This we know from the other Gospels. But the colt is standing at the door in the open street. 
Why do the evangelists give us such details? It's because it's important. Otherwise, they, they wouldn't bother. So the door represents the church, and the Gentiles are outside of the church. The open street, the crossroads, is the world where we can choose which way to go. There are many ways in which we can go, but there's only one way to get through the door, because Christ is the door. And so they're told, untie it. The Lord had told them to untie it. And as he said, there are people standing there, ask, what are you doing? And they gave them the answer, and they permitted it to go. Who were these men who objected? Well, the colt is standing in the open. And in the open, there are the demons, and they're the ones who are objecting. Because Christ is calling the Gentiles to himself. But they are powerless. They have, they're compelled to let them go. Our Lord sent two disciples, as indeed he sent the two disciples to preach. He, at least he sent the disciples out two by two to preach. And the two is also important because it reminds us of charity. It's not possible for one to love by himself, herself. He always needs another. But the two also represent knowledge and action. And we see this in the case where the Lord led the people out of Egypt by two brothers. We know also that the, the Ark of the Covenant was carried on two poles. We know that the mercy seat was surmounted by two cherubim. We know also of the two fountains that sprang up in which they washed. And throughout the scriptures, we find this two appearing again and again. In the New Testament, when our Lord called his first disciples, he called a pair of brothers, or rather a pair of a pair of brothers. For he called Andrew and his brother Simon, and then he called James and John. And so here we, we have the, the, the Gentiles, the cult, on the crossroads, two roads. Which way will they go? Well, they are brought to the Lord, and we're told that Jesus, the, the disciple, they took the colt to Jesus, and they threw their cloaks on its back, and he sat on it. And so begins the devotion to our Lord. We're told the people, there were many of them, spread their cloaks on the road. So what is the spreading of the cloaks? But essentially giving ourselves entirely to him. In the case of the apostles, they place their clothes on the back of the, of, the, of, the, of the colt. And our Lord sits on them. So our Lord is seated on the apostles. And the apostles themselves are in charge of the Gentiles. So they go out into the whole world and preach the good news to, to, all, to all mankind. But the people, the Jews who believe... They spread their cloaks on the road. And so those who believe submit to our Lord, for he walks on them. And that is not all. They also cut the greenery from the fields. And these also they, they placed on the road. And so the greenery, which are called the palms of the just. This represents the virtues that we should practice. And the only way in which we can ensure that these virtues remain with us is, in fact, if we give them to the Lord. In other words, we cannot practice virtue without Christ. And so this represents the total submission. And there are those who go in the front and those who follow. So these are those who believe in him. Those who go before are the prophets who are speaking about his coming. And those who follow behind are the apostles, who are declared to the whole world, to the Gentiles, that he has come. And both of them are singing what? They're shouting, Hosanna, save us. That's what Hosanna means, save us. Blessings on him who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming of the kingdom of our father David. 
and this immediately takes us back to Bethlehem where the angel speaks uh, and to Nazareth where the angel speaks to Our Lady that he will rule over the house of David forever but he comes also in the name of the Lord which contradicts what the Pharisees are saying Hosanna in the highest and here we are joined in Bethlehem for what did the angels declare on the night of his birth glory to God in the highest heaven and peace to those who are his friends who believe in him who observe his will who do his will and so the passion of our Lord which is approaching within four days of Palm Sunday and his birth are joined together in this single moment as our Lord enters into Jerusalem we have many things happening there are the crowds who welcome him they have heard of what he has done they now understand in part some of his teaching we have Pilate who is watching and Pilate necessarily was in Jerusalem because he knew at, the, at, at festival times there will be tumult there will be disturbance among the people and he's watching and no doubt he's looking at the scene and thinking with some irony is this the king riding on a donkey and of course the Pharisees and they're watching and they're angry in St. Luke's Gospel they come down to our Lord and said stop the people stop them don't you hear what they're saying this is blasphemy because they're declaring his kingship and his divinity and our Lord said if I tell them to be quiet the very stones here would cry out in other words all nature will proclaim the truth and this in fact is what we need to do even today to know the truth and to proclaim the truth the pair the two things to know and to speak or indeed to do because doing itself is speaking in our age in our days we notice increasingly the anti-christian spirit that is moving throughout the world any religion and all religions are tolerated except that of Christ and this surely takes us right back to Jerusalem on Palm Sunday at this moment the whole world as the Pharisees said are following him they heard him and they believe yet within four days the same crowd who welcomed him would shout crucify him isn't this what has happened in our world there was a time when the whole world indeed followed Christ but now we are seeing very clearly in the halls of power we see in the families we see even in the church there's a call to reject Christ and to shout crucify him and so those who do believe must throw their cloaks at his feet and ask him to ride through our lives and to take us with him it is only by humility that we can survive the days that are to come humility will cause us to recognize that we can do nothing without God and then we will be given the gift that is so necessary fortitude by which we can persevere to the end in believing there is no other name by which we might be saved except of Christ Jesus our Lord in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Santa Maria, Mater Dei.